Welcome to the Fish North Georgia podcast, where we talk everything fishing here in North Georgia. Make a cast over that brush pile and bring wolf packs of spotted bass up. Georgia is blessed with so many of these electric only lakes. No, I didn't say that, Danny. Don't, okay, don't so, be speculating uh, now. So okay, guys, today we got a treat for you. Uh, we've got an actual fish biologist. Is that the correct terminology? Yeah, fisheries biology. Fishery yeah. biology. Uh, this is Shane O'Gorman, and um, I, we grew up together, haven't seen him in a long time. We've kind of reunited here lately, and I thought he would be able to bring some absolute great information from you guys. So uh, real quick, why don't you kind of tell me and everybody listening a little bit about your education and what you do, and we'll go from there. Okay. Well, I, uh, I got a degree in fisheries biology from Georgia. And for people who don't know that term, um, it's basically like a marine biologist, but we study the freshwater fish. Okay. Marine biologists study saltwater fish predominantly. Right. It's not that we didn't study any saltwater fish. We did a few. And it's not that they don't study some fresh, but they separate them. Gotcha. Um, and upon graduation, I started my own business, uh, managing lakes throughout the southeast. And I've been doing that for, since the 90s, since 97 when I started. Okay, so when you say managing a lake, yeah, describe that. Okay, let's say you have a lake in your backyard, and we're talking pond, an acres. acre to a thousand acres. Okay, right. um, once it gets past about fifty acres, it's considered a lake. Okay, under that's considered a pond. But uh, yeah, I, I've stocked fish, I've controlled aquatic weeds. Uh, we do this thing called electrofishing surveys. It's basically like a fish taser. Uh, stuns the fish so we can sample them, weigh them, measure them, and, and make a determination of the balance of the fishery, uh, you know, based on their weight mm -hmm. uh, and relative abundance. Um, most, water quality testing. Most, done a of lot the, of that. most of these, are they, are they existing lakes or do you, have you ever took one from the beginning? And Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, actually, I, I, I wish a lot of my clients would just drain and restock their lakes. It'd be a lot easier. In fact, if, if everybody would just drain and restock their ponds about every eight or 10 years, they wouldn't even need me. <laughs> oh, really? And why <laughs> no. is that? It just keeps the balance there. Um, what happens usually is uh, people catch and release everything, and they don't have any competing fish like crappie um, in their pond. So the bass tend to crowd, and it's about... 90% of the problems you see with lakes is bass heavy problems. They actually have too many bass. And in that scenario, since there are too many, there's not enough food to go around each individual fish and their growth slows and sometimes stops. Mm. Um, it's not much different than cows on a pasture. You can't have as many cows as you, you can't go buy 10 acres and put 10,000 cows out there. It doesn't work that way. And that's how people are trying to manage their bass fisheries these days. Their pond can only hold so many fish so if it has too many, their weights are going to suffer. Okay, so your job basically is to come in and try to give the balance, the, the perfect scenario of bass, bait fish, catfish, I assume. Exactly, you know, sure, yeah. Uh, catfish for controlling the bottom or for bait? I mean, how do you? Uh, catfish, actually, you can have or not have catfish in, in a small lake. Um, they will, once you put them on a feeder and they'll go to five, six, seven pounds in about a year on feed. Cause they readily take the feed. They will start competing with your bass. So if you want a trophy bass fishery, I wouldn't recommend adding catfish. Just stick with the bass. What do you think is a perfect size? If you were going to build a trophy bass lake for a client, what's the perfect size pond or lake? <sighs> That's a good question. I've seen great lakes that are under 10 acres and I've seen I've, it's, that's a tough question. Well, what makes a great lake? Let's, how about that? Balance. Okay. Balance of what? The fish, the fisheries balance. Um, without the proper balance, your fish can't grow. Let's go back. We talked about uh, our bass being um, slightly heavy or mm -hmm. slightly light, um, in a balanced fishery. You're going to have bass of all different sizes. That's the number one thing I'm looking for when I'm running my shock boat. I'm looking for one pounders, two pounders, up to seven, eight, nine pounders. Uh, Ten pounders is great. I don't really care if I see a big kicker fish like that because once they get to about four pounds and their mouth is about that wide, they can eat just about anything they want in the lake. Mm -hmm. And you usually don't see bass that are 
you know, over 16 inches long that are underweight because they can eat other bass. They can eat anything they want. Um, so it's once they get to that level. It's that 12 to 16 inch slot limit right. that I usually end up put, literally doing that, putting a slot limit on the fish. If you catch a fish between 12 and 15, it comes out. If you catch a fish over 16, it goes back. Um, and these are on lakes that you run. That's your recommendation. If it's bass heavy. Now, it, on the flip side of that coin, say you have a problem, you have a competing species problem. Crappy is, is the number one problem with competing species in small lakes. And the reason why is crappy spawn earlier in the spring. So early, in fact, that their babies, their fry, have an opportunity like a month and a half, six weeks, seven, eight weeks sometimes ahead of the bass. So all those crappy fry are in the grass, in the rocks, in the edges, and they're growing before the bass ever are born. Then you have your bass hatch. And they go up in there, and they're going right up in there with the crappy. All those larval fish are going to do the same thing. They're going to go right to the shallow water, right to the edge. But at that point, the crappy fry are big enough to eat the bass fry. And you can literally have a lakes under 50 acres um, where you have no bass in them anymore because of a crappy population. Because of crappy. So mm -hmm. your recommendation uh, for those of us that like crappy, like to eat them? Eat them. Cape them. Catch, uh, if you have, you can't keep too many crappy. That's good. That's good. I like that <laughs> advice because that gives me permission. Yeah. Now, so basically, you've taken your degree and you have put it in use, managing ponds, designing ponds. I imagine, yeah. like you put the structure in. If somebody wants to say, if somebody wants say a, a trophy lake, what kind of structure do you put in? And I assume this is for largemouth bass, not spots. Yeah, we don't mess with spots too much in small impoundments. They don't do good. They need the rocks. Okay. They need the rock cliffs. They need 30 feet of water. They're just kind of a big open water reservoir type of bass. They don't do great in smaller impoundments. Um, so I don't really manage for them. Anytime someone transports them over, they usually lose weight and they'll live their life out there. They're not going to die in there, but they're not going to spawn. They're not going to become a... So it's not their potential will not be reached in a smaller no, lake. No. Um, so yeah, we definitely manage for, for the large mouse. Um, okay. and what kind of structure are we talking in, in a lake you design? I don't care, man. Um, I was on a shocking job once and this neighborhood, the homeowner association, they decided they didn't want anything in the lake. Nothing. They went and took out all the sticks. They took out all the rocks. It was like a cereal bowl and it was only a couple of acres, but mm -hmm. they didn't have any structure. If there was a blow down, they pulled it out. They just wanted a nice, clean pond. And when I was running around, I was having a hard time locating the fish because there was no structure to shock around. Right. Um, I came across one of those little uh, yellow shovels that the kids use at the beach to dig in the sand. It was just floating on the water. And a shocking boat has a, a pedal that you step on from the back. It's, it completes the circuit. So if I see a dog or a kid or something happens coming near the boat, I can let up on the pedal and it stops the electricity. So I let up on the pedal and I got close to the, to the, uh, shovel, the yellow shovel kind of as a joke. And I stepped on it. That's a good way to get your field really close to the structure. You let up on it and you move up to a tree or rocks or whatever you step on it and it hit it. And man, man, there was like 30 bass sitting up under that yellow Just shovel. Under that shovel. Mm -hmm. Just because relating was, to it. That's was, all it is. Because there was nothing else for them to relate to. Really, mm -hmm. and that, I guess that's just innate in the bass structure. It is. Got to be there. They they use it. Um, they use good structure. It's like a convenience store for them. It makes it easier for them to eat. And if I'd say one thing to a fisherman about structure is watch the shadows. The fish, the bass especially, use the shadows. Um, it gives them a, an advantage visually, and you can see it in everyday life. Go stand in the shade and let somebody stand in the sun. You can see them easily, but they can't see you easily. And that's what bass do. They get inside on underneath things and, and use that shadow so they can get closer so they can catch their food. To ambush. Mm -hmm. It's an ambush. It's a, it's a visual advantage. Describe the shocking. The shocking. Well, we use a, a, the boat is aluminum, which most people think is crazy. <laughs> yeah, well, I was going to say that. <laughs> um, the boat it's basically no different than a welder kind of controlled chaos if you will right you have uh wires that hang in the front the boat is actually the ground you get uh your electricity from a generator and you have a shock box which is not much different than a welder and the positive is the wires in the water and the negative is the boat 
So as long as you don't put your hand in, you use a, uh, an insulated a fiberglass dip net, uh, you can collect the fish as they come into the field. They'll get stunned like a taser. And that's how it works. How many volts are we talking? Oh, we use 5,000. My, my old boat has a 5,000-watt generator, and it won't quite use all of it. You know, So you're probably looking at 3,000 or so watts. But um, it also depends on the water quality. Um, say muddy water is way more conductive than clear water. Okay. So I can turn the box way down. What I'm looking for is amps. So if I can get, you know, 2,500 uh, watts on about two, three amps of current, I'm going to be really turning fish up. And really, how, really well. how long does it stun the fish? The fish just lose their ability to control their muscles. So if he's swimming, he'll keep swimming, but he'll swim kind of crazy. Right. You know, like, like those videos you see on YouTube of guys getting hit with tasers. Makes sense. Same thing. Okay. Sometimes they lay there. Sometimes they have a fit. I, I want to ask you this question. Do you remember the old-fashioned telephone crank? Sure do. Now, my grandfather had one of those. I know they're slightly illegal, and God rest his soul, he's not around anymore. So I don't know where that thing's at. How did that work? Because I always heard you had to have a sandy bottom or something well, like that. Well, you had to have a lot of special techniques there. Uh, they, that little phone didn't put out enough, and generally all they would get is catfish with that. Okay. Uh, scaled fish are harder to shock up because that scales are like armor. But a catfish doesn't have the scales, and they're real susceptible to the electricity. So, yeah, with those old phones, and even a trolling motor battery, you can you can do two wires and short it right and, and shock, use enough, get enough electricity to shock up a, a catfish with it. Really? Uh-huh. Uh, just old-fashioned ingenuity is Tickling them up. That. Tickling <laughs> them up. So you experienced in, when you do this electric, you're doing surveys. So you're, you're taking the population and kind of, you know, judging and seeing what you need to do by what is coming up. Basically what you're going to end up with is three different ideas. Like you're, you're going to narrow your field down to it's a balanced fishery and the fish look good, which is basically I'm catching fish of all sizes. I'm catching bluegill and bass, at least two different species of fish and they're reproducing. Um, and I want to see them healthy. I want to see them above the relative weight that we've been talking about. And I want to see them all different sizes. And as long as you've got that, you're in good shape. You don't really need to play the catch and release game or the harvest game. You can let it go or not. It's up to you. Um, if you have a small lake, I'd probably recommend you always keep about 10 pounds of bass per acre per year just because they have a tendency to go to bass heavy. If you get in the habit of keeping a few, it's just easier for you. Don't let it get so far out of control. You know, If you have crappy in your pond, you can't practice catch and release like that. You know, you, you, you kind of have to always put them back because the crappy are always going to be competing with your bass that way. Right. Um, so the crappy can really can really cause you some problems that way, and you can't. Some some years you'll need to be keeping some bass, and some years you'll need to be always be throwing them back with the crappy. So in there. it can and change you, annually. It can. It just depends on the weather, the reproductive cycles, and lots of different things. What's the biggest fish you've ever shocked up? <laughs> Bass or fish? Well, let's 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 start, let's start with bass. What's the biggest bass you've ever shocked up? I've had two ten pound fish, one in each hand, one in each hand. Mm-hmm. South Georgia, North Georgia, North where? Carolina, North Carolina. Mm-hmm. It was about a seventy acre lake. It was what I would consider we'll call bass light. Mm-hmm. Um, not a heavy bass population, but when you see the shock survey, what you're going to see in that lake is you're going to see crappy, you're going to see gizzard shad, you're going to see threadfin shad. Warmouth, bluegill, gar, carp. Uh, you're going to see a bunch of different fish species in there and a few bass. But the bass that are there have plenty to eat. And they're big. They get big. Okay. What's the biggest fish you've ever shot? I saw a sturgeon one time bigger than the boat we were in. It was 15 feet long. And that was where? That was in the Savannah River. Savannah River. I got a great story about the Savannah River, as a matter of fact. Um, I was doing a job. This wasn't a, for a fish management. This was for uh, contaminants. We were testing the fish for metals. So you had to catch the fish and send them to a lab to get them tested. I don't even remember what we were testing for. It was, I don't know, mercury or something. I, don't, I can't remember. Right. Um, so we had three areas that we had to, to sample the fish from. Above the plant, at the plant where the discharge was, I think it was a paper mill. 
Is there a paper mill or a power company? I can't even remember what it was. So, um, but a warm water discharge. Yeah, they had a warm water discharge. They used to cool the facility for whatever reason, right. and uh, and then the state makes you makes those guys test those fish, make sure they're not contaminating them, and that's what we were doing. The problem was the the lower one back behind because the the EPD the EPA EPD um, guys tell you the size fish you need to catch, the species of fish you need to catch, and the locations you need to catch them, and we had to go do that. And we were, we got down to the, the last one down there and we turned the shock boat on. And the first thing that went by was a stingray. The second thing that went by was a tarpon. Up the Savannah River. Down the Savannah, right, down the Savannah River. River. Yeah, we were about 20 miles from the coast at that point. So we were getting really close to the salt. And that's bad for shock boats because it's so conductive. The electricity doesn't work anymore. I get where you're going. So if you can't get them with the shock boat, you have to get the nets out. And you don't want to get the nets out, man. 150-foot gill nets, whew, that's work. So I'm praying, please, please. we got two weeks to find like a dozen bass between, I think, 12 and 14 inches, 12 and 15 inches. They had to be in a slot too, you know? Right. And we're looking at saltwater fish. I'm like, we're going to be down here forever. And we, build, we, bidded our, we bid our time. Two weeks. It'll take us two weeks to do the job. So we're getting paid for two weeks. If it takes us two months, then... So be it. You get paid two weeks. took us two minutes. Oh, really? Yeah. We went down and we didn't... weren't finding anything. weren't finding anything for a couple of hours. And there was a blowdown. A big one. A big tree. A 200-year-old oak tree in the water. that had been washed in somehow. And I looked back at my friend and I said, Hey, there's a big blowdown. You know, kill the power. Let's get up on it step on the pedal and see what happens up there. As soon as we stepped on that pedal, it was all largemouth bass on that tree. And they were all probably 12 to 20 inches long. And I'm, when I'm, I'm talking like, I don't know, man, it went, it went from no fish to all the bass we needed in 30 seconds. But in salt water? It was right there in that brackish water. And that, yeah, there was tarpon and redfish, and but they were all just piled up on that blowdown, and we got every fish we needed right then. And we got two weeks worth of work done in right about there. two minutes. Well, that, <laughs> well, that, that's good, and it's lucky for you. Yeah. But but I'm I'm really curious as to how a fish can be in that type of mixture of a water. Oh, the bass can handle that salt. Yeah. Really? Yeah, it wasn't too salty for them. Obviously, they wouldn't have been there. And tarpon and stingrays can go into freshwater. Mm-hmm. Sure can. And doesn't mess with them. They just yep. They have the ability to to, to deal with that as well. And they're not going to run way up into the into the pure fresh. And the bass obviously aren't going to run way down into the pure salt. But you got a good you know mixture there of the fresh and the salt. They can they can definitely interact in there. The interesting side note to that story though is uh, about I think it's about three years later uh, we got the same job again, and we bid it the same, and we went down there and found that tree, and it happened again. So All those knew. bass were right there on that tree three years later. So what you're saying is bass relate to structure? Bass relate a lot to structure. Um, one of the th- We talked about Berkeley Lake earlier. Uh, one of the things I used to do at Berkeley Lake when I managed it, there's a good population of, of fishermen at that lake. And sometimes in the lake management business, you don't have fishermen at your lakes, which seems strange to guys like us. It does. But there's a lot of lakes that I managed that people didn't care about the fish. You know, they just didn't fish. Um, but that Berkeley Lake in Duluth there, they're – there was a lot of fishermen at that place. So what I would do is I would say, all right, guys, let's go down the dam. You guys fish down the dam, all the riprap, and then into a cove, um, blowdowns, docks, you know, that kind of thing. Fish it all back over here. Maybe 10 boats. Go fish those blowdowns over there, you know, wherever. Just stay right around in here. And they'd all go fish. And then I'd put the shocking boat in behind them and show them what was there. And they would always be amazed that you could go get 20 30 40 bass out from behind them after everybody fished around through there and couldn't catch anything the fish are there they're always there they're just not biting just not biting Mm -hmm. so you basically what you're saying is we're going over fish left and right without knowing that they're there i would say this to anybody if you know a lake especially if you've caught a big fish in a spot remember that spot because i used to do that a lot I'd put my shock boat in and I'd go around a lake that I'd shocked before 
and there'd be a stump, a ditch, I don't know, what, who cares, whatever, X, Y, Z structure there. I could call it. Like, get ready, there's a big fish coming, and it would come. Because they orient to that structure all the time. They're always there. They're always going to use it. They're always going to take advantage of it. Year after year after year, they'll be there. And so what you're saying is once one is pulled out, another one's going to take its spot. I always make that note on my on my map. I caught this 8-pounder or this 5-pounder here because there's that, that's the spot that's going to hold big fish. And there's, is it just something there that drew a big fish there, and it's just going to draw another one? Yep. They'll always be there. They'll always move in and off that spot. Okay. That's, that's interesting information to have right mm-hmm. there. But it makes sense. Yeah. Work, work, work the places that you've caught fish really hard because they're there. All right, so now that we've established that you have some knowledge into fish behavior, that you've been educated in such knowledge, let's get into talking about fish themselves. Okay. I've got probably 20-something questions here that I want to throw at you in no particular order. Okay. um, That some have been given from our viewers, some came from my head, and some suggestions that you said, you know, we might want to talk about. This one came from a viewer, um, a good friend of mine, but he fishes Lake Lanier, a ton. Mm-hmm. And he wants to know what your opinion is on stripers in Lake Lanier. Good for the bass, bad for the bass. What's your opinion on stripers in Lanier? That's a good question. Uh, I think they're essential to the fishery. And I think the state biologists are, are using them because they know they have to. Um, they're going to be controlling those shad populations that are out in that open water. They're going to pack up in school and run around. That's just the nature of how they hunt, you know, the way they behave. And they, and that's what the biologists use them for. Open water. They're so, not relating to structure. Right. They're pack hunters, and they're pushing those shad around. So I realize the, the bass fishermen think that the, they're probably eating too much of the bait fish. But come on, let's be honest. You've seen the footballs, the spots look like these days. They got plenty to eat in there. And I like the striper because they're going to be pushing those schools of shad around, going to be pushing them up into the rocks. They're going to be moving them around. I think they actually help the spots more than they hurt them. You think they help the spots. So what you're saying is is the state is putting them in there for control of bait and yeah. not for money. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people that well, – <laughs> I would say that the striping, striper fishing is brings a lot of money, and that definitely factors in. Okay, so yeah. but primarily, primarily, I think they're a useful tool as a biologist. Yeah, I would. I like to use them. I've used them before in smaller impoundments. Really, mm, hybrids. Mm-hmm. Hybrids. Okay, mm-hmm. what kind of lake? What size lake are we talking about? Oh, three acres. Really, hybrids mm-hmm. in three acres. Yeah, they take pellets like catfish, so you can grow massive hybrids in small bodies of water. Now, do you still have bass in those lakes? Oh, sure. Okay, so mm-hmm. but the reason is, what's the thinking there? Well, the the lake that I'm thinking of in particular uh, had I had a shad die off okay. in the summertime, and he was all freaked out. He had lost his shad, so we had to go do a shocking survey. And when I stepped on the pedal, the numbers of thread fins that were still in there were ridiculous. And I said, you know, let's think about adding another predator to help control some of these shad in here. And we just put in about forty or fifty uh, hybrids. Uh, to keep the shad numbers a little bit lower so we could alleviate them dying like that. Um, they get high in numbers. Anytime you get a, any fish population high in numbers, uh, they're going to be low in food, and that's going to affect their immune system. They're going to become more susceptible to disease. I've seen that with Bass Heavy ponds a lot of times. Now explain uh, Bass Heavy. What, what are we talking Bass Heavy? Bass Heavy is just a, a, a term that we use that it describes the population. It just means there's a few too many bass in it. Okay. And you can tell by their, 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 their weights, the length versus their weight. Uh, we, we use a, a measurement called relative weight okay. to compare uh, basically the fish that we sampled to the average. And if your fish are below average, that's a real good indication that you have too many of them. Which is the relative weight. The that's relative the average. Weight. Yeah, the relative weight is just the average for bass in North America. And if you looked at the chart right now, like 24-inch fish is 8.1 pounds. Uh, 12.5-inch fish is exactly one pound. Um, I just have those numbers committed to memory. Right. But if, say, you're on your, your pond or your lake or whatever, and you're catching 12.5-inch bass that weigh three-quarters of a pound consistently, there's a sign that you have too many 12.5-inch bass 
and you need to start keeping some of those. I, I would start keeping those until their weights improve to average now you or reali- better. You realize you just threw out a faux pas or whatever they call it, and all these guys <laughs> at Bass Fish are like, whoa, wait a second. Yeah. We don't keep bass around here in Georgia. I know. Okay, and exactly. that was the biggest problem I've ever had managing fisheries was actually getting people. They would pay me thousands of dollars to go assess their fishery. I'd tell them keep bass, and they wouldn't do it. And then they'd come back the next year and say, how many fish did you keep? None. Well, you're not going to have any improvement in the growth then. And so what you're saying is if, if you're on a lake and you're seeing by this relative weight, um, a lot of these, your, your recommendation is just, let's get some out. Yeah, we'll put a slot limit on them. And, and it's, it's so, like, consistent. Like, I've seen it so many times over and over again. Your, fish are, your slot limit is going to be between usually 12 and 14 inches long. That's the problem area. Those are the fish that you're going to want to harvest. They'll get to 12 inches in a year, and then they'll stay there for five. You know, and yep. you don't want that. We want those fish to grow. We want those fish to go 12, 13, 14, all and up to 20 and, and reach their potential. And if they're getting stuck, even for a brief period of time, even for a year, well, they just lost a whole year. You know, they just yeah. lost a fifth of their life, sixth of their okay. life. That's what I was going to say. And what's yeah. the lifespan of a bass? Eh, seven years or so. I mean, you can get them to 10, but, uh, you know, I'd say the average is probably about seven years. So if you have a, a fish that, you know, even gets stunted, like I've seen fish seven years old that are 12 inches long. They, they stop growing. Now, how do you tell the age of a bass? You can tell the age of a bass two ways. Um, the f- easiest way and the safest way for the fish is to pull a scale. And by pulling the scale, you just look at it under a light magnification on a microscope, um, like maybe like 10 times power. And they lay down growth rings like a tree. Mm. They lay down growth rings. The lines get a little bit closer in the wintertime and a little further apart. And you can count the number of years the fish has been alive. That's interesting. I did yeah. not know that. Uh, the only other way to do it is to cut the, the same way, but it's with their ear bone. But their ear bone's inside their head, and you have to kill them to cut it out. <laughs> right, so, yeah. Uh, that's a more accurate way to do it, but that's also, you know. And just kind of describe that. What are you looking for with the ear bone as a biologist, you know, when you're trying to do it? What, what, what is, what's it showing? Uh, just the age of the fish. It lays down layers in there as Rings well. Rings and stuff. Yeah, so, you similar. would cut the ear bone in half and look in there at the layers and count, just like the scale. It's just more accurate. The The scales are kind of open for interpretation. They can be damaged sometimes and give you faults, you know, little weird things like that. Um, we try to pull, you know, eight or ten scales off the fish to make sure we get a good clean one to try to determine their ages. But I really... I didn't really get into uh, to aging fish that much. As long as the fish are, are above our average relative weight or slightly above average, you don't have to really worry about how old they are. They're growing fine. Okay, so tell me about a lake that is, you said, bass heavy. Mm-hmm. Now, what are the, I assume there's balanced. Yep, balanced would be what we're looking for. Right. And then, for lack of a better term, we'll call another fishery bass light. Bass you know, light. It has uh, probably competing species is the best way to describe that. You're going to have crappy um, or some other fish that's limiting your bass, competing with your bass for food and taking, just taking food right out of their mouth so they can't eat. And Let, let's go back to the hybrids that you put in the lake. Why not crappy? Crappy are the crappy are bad for most small lakes and I don't recommend stocking them ever. They spawn earlier in the spring than large mouse. And since they get that jump start, their babies are around the edge and feeding on zooplankton and small fish that the bass should be feeding on. So they're literally at a, almost like a microscopic, you know, tiny little clear fish, but they're already eating what the bass want to eat when they come off the bed. What, even worse, once the bass hatch out, the crappy fry are big enough to eat the bass fry. So crappy can actually reduce the numbers of bass in a small lake or pond. Okay, and the hybrids don't do that. The hybrids don't do that because they don't spawn. So your sterile hybrids. Yeah, the, the, the white they're they're cross between stripers and white bass, and they just don't they don't so, really so spawn. Okay. In, you know, they don't really give you a spawn in there. So if I put fifty hybrids in there, I've got fifty hybrids in there. But if I've got crappy in my pond. I have no idea what they're doing year in and year out to my bass reproduction without checking it. Okay. All right. That's excellent. All right. So uh, one of our viewers named Kyle Rogers, he submitted a question and his question was kind of, it was like six or seven in one, (laughs) Um, but I'm going to condense it down. And so he'll know what I'm talking about. 
Um, a good example in one of our previous podcasts with the Fluke Master, he came in, Gene Jensen, he talked about how Alabama, South Carolina, Tennessee, all the states surrounding Georgia, you know, you can make a living as a largemouth guide because those states promoted the largemouth fisheries. Mm-hmm. It seems to be something that's absent here in Georgia, especially, I would say, making north at least. I don't know how south Georgia is, but up here, you know, it's spotted bass, spotted bass, spotted bass. And so kind of what he wanted to know is, is there a reason why they're doing that? Or is there something, is there a reason why they're not promoting it, trying to increase the largemouth habitat? What's your take on that, even if you can answer that question? Well, that's a, yeah, that's a tough one. Um, I would say here in North Georgia, we've got perfect lakes for spotted bass. They've got the perfect habitat. And you've got clear water, you've got cliffs, rocks. They love it. That's how they breed. They have to have that to breed. And once you get spotted bass, say, in the Lake Lanier, there's no point in managing for largemouth bass anymore. You have to deal with both of them. You're not going to get rid of the spots. They're always going to be there. In it. And we really just our deep, clear water lakes are really ideal for spotted bass. Um, and plus we have a problem with people moving fish around. You know, we blueback herring, flathead catfish in South Georgia. Uh, the snakehead catfish is pop, or the snakehead fish has popped up there in Gwinnett. Right, yeah. You know, people moving stuff around. So I think here for North Georgia, the the biologists probably have their hands tied a little bit with the spots. They have to manage them and the largemouth together. Um, but you're right. They don't have a dedicated trophy bass fishery. Uh, and I would like to see that. I think they might, they might come at it from a different ideology. Maybe, uh, the public waters need to be more, uh, easy for everyone to fish, uh, so to speak, right. instead of just for trophy management. It seems that most of our lakes are managed that way for numbers and not particularly trophy size, but you know, I don't work for the DNR. That's, yeah. uh, that's up to them. But so you're basically, you're theorizing it's more for the public enjoyment than it is for the trophy aspect. Yes. Or the... Yeah. I feel like they kind of manage the, the deer population the same way. Yeah. That's why you can kill so many. I yeah. guess like that. Okay. So let's get into the actual fish itself. Okay. Okay. So I've, I've got several questions here. Um, one from Travis samples. Um, actually let's start with Tyler McGinnis first. Do fish have feelings or have feeling in their mouth or lips? Do fish have feeling in their mouths or lips? A uh, simple answer. Yes. Um, okay. not like our mouths and lips though. Um, they don't have the nerve endings in there like we do. And you, everybody's picked up a catfish. Everybody's picked up a bluegill. Who's probably watching. You've been finned by a fish before. Um, bass are designed to eat that like a pin cushion in their mouth. You mm. know, their mouths are tough. That cartilage is tough. And even though they can feel it, they just don't have like what we would have as far as a nervous system in there. And it's subject for debate on whether or not they even feel that as pain, you know, cause they just don't have enough pain receptors in there to really tell that they're being injured in any kind of way. So yes, they do have feeling, but no, it's not similar to ours. Their mouths can handle hooks. Their mouths can handle fish fins and they're, they're just designed for it. So hooking a fish doesn't hurt them at all. If that's kind of where it sounds like that's going. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Another viewer named Lee Sant, he wanted to know if, Fish can taste. They absolutely can taste. Okay. Um, great example are your uh, channel catfish. Uh, they have taste buds all over their body. They're in higher numbers in their mouth and on their barbels, but they have they're like a swimming tongue, and they can taste their they taste their way around. Basically, it's interesting to think about though, because when you think about it, you're in the water, um, taste and smell kind of become the same thing. You know, because right. it's floating in the water. So they do they do have a sense of smell as well, and, and water can go in their nostrils and they can smell. But the taste, uh, catfish are covered in taste buds and, and literally taste their way around. They can, they, they taught us in school that um, it was some crazy amount of feet away, 200 feet away or something, uh, that they, they tested the catfish. They could tell by the reaction of the fish that... Uh, they could taste up to that distance away. But ironically enough, their tank was also that long. 
they couldn't go any further away from the fish. So they couldn't. They, they, it's possible. It <laughs> it's could have been possible. Even more. It could be even further than the two hundred feet. Okay. Well, uh, well, it definitely is. I think. Well, how about bass? How does that relate to bass? How do they? They have taste buds as well. Um, they're more localized on their lips and in their mouth, not all over their body. More okay. on their head and inside their mouth, but they absolutely have taste. Yes. Okay. So is it similar to ours on our tongue, or, or when you say taste buds, we're talking the yeah, same thing? Same thing. Same thing. Okay. Um, a buddy of ours, Shane Dover, asked that question. You kind of touched on it right then. Sense of smell. You say it's kind of similar to taste. So kind of let's expand on that a little bit. This, yeah, yeah, they have a nose, and the water goes in there, and they can smell those molecules. Um, absolutely. They – let's take salmon, for example. Um, they have proven that – or any fish, really, that goes up a river to spawn back out to the ocean then back up the river, you know, comes back. It's actually their nose that leads them back. Really? Mm-hmm. They imprint on the smell of the stream. And the guys who figured that out put a scent in the water. I can't remember what it was. And they let fish go out of a tank. In, I believe it was in Oregon. And let the, let the salmon go out to sea. And the next year they came back and came right back up and sw- literally swam right back into the tank they were born in. Because of the scent. No, they took the scent then and moved it to another stream, did it again, and those salmon ran up the other stream where the scent was. They didn't come back to the tank. That's amazing. So they proved that they used their nose to get back home. Okay, so how about a largemouth bass or a spotted bass? Um, and I ask this because there's a big market today with scents. Mm-hmm. You know, I've seen it. You've got your garlics, and I've even got a bottle that a, a buddy of mine gave that is crawfish you know, boil down crawfish scent. Sure. And uh, you've been told, you know, just spray it on that or sprinkle it on that or soak them in that for X amount of time. So does it work? Is that gimmicks? What's your take on that? That's a great question. Um, I don't think it's a gimmick. But I also don't know how, I can't quantify how well it works. I know this, I know why I use scents anyway. Okay. Um, have you seen the scents that they, they kind of look like chapstick? They come to like it looks just like a, it's a shad tube or a crawfish tube. It looks like chapstick, right? Like a little pasty. Thing. I haven't, but I. <laughs> um, I'll put them on my swim baits when I'm dragging them in the winter time. Have you ever picked up one of those rubber swim baits? They almost they feel dry and they feel clammy. They feel funny. Yes. If you take that stick and you rub it on that rubber uh, fish, it gives it a slime coat. It makes it feel like a fish to me. So I use that scent. In that situation, when I'm wintertime fishing and I'm just bumping the bottom, just dragging it real slow, and I want that fish to grab it and hold on to it, I'll use that fish scent to try to give it a, a you know, a little more natural feel because it is a slow presentation. But the fact, like a mouth feel as well, when it goes into their mouth, it feels slimy. It feels like a fish. It doesn't feel like a dry piece of plastic. And that's what I like the sense for. Okay, so you use it for a totally different way. Just yeah. Not even, so you, <laughs> well, I think it works. I, 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 I do. I think it might, once it's in their mouth, I think it helps them hold it a little okay. bit. Okay. Why garlic? I have no idea. I mean, it seems to be the predominant I scent know. out there. Somebody said, I want to put a worm and I want it to smell like garlic and the fish like it. Yeah. And you, there's no, there's no educational reason as to why fish like garlic or even if they Not do. that I've ever read. Okay. So it's just, garlic is a gimmick. Cause I mean, it's not natural to the water. So yeah, I would, I like to stay with the natural stuff, the shads, the crawfishes, stuff like that. But you know, there's garlic and worms. Some of the worms, they put it in there and different well, things. So well, you got glow in the dark worms. Now like real worms are glow in the dark now. And I'm just kind of looking at that. I, I, I wonder if that's <laughs> I saw a some of those chartreuse worms. <laughs> I've never seen a natural chartreuse worm in a water in my entire life, but maybe it works. Somebody's it buying does. it. Oh, yeah. Okay, so uh, sense of smell, anything we can wrap up on that. Um, did their nose work? Is it like ours? or yeah, pretty or much the same it, thing. I didn't know if maybe it was like a snake, you know, where they could kind of taste the air molecules or something, if it was some kind well, of Well, those magic. molecules are floating in the water again. Right. So, you know, it's got to float through the water and it's got to go into their nose and they got to smell it or it's got to float through the water and maybe touch a taste bud and they can taste it. And that's kind of where you draw, uh, it's kind of where a fuzzy line, a gray area is, 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 is it even taste or smell to a fish, you know? Because right. like a dog, they say that a dog can taste, you know, what it's smelling Oh, is so really? good yeah they're like, they're, their sense of smell is so good they can actually taste it you know those molecules it gives them so it's kind of the same thing i got you okay um how well do fish hear or do they hear at all 
They hear very well. Okay. They actually hear uh, sound travels in water way differently than it travels through the air. It travels faster. Um, okay, let's 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 spend some time right here. <laughs> okay. So uh, we we talked about when we age a fish, you would cut the fish's ear out. Right. Uh, that ear bone is called the ogolith, and the ogolith sits inside um, inside the fish's ear in its head. Just imagine our ear and eardrums uh, without an external ear. Okay, so you've got a bone sitting in, and it has uh, kind of hairs that touch it. And as the sound waves move through the water and move through the fish, it moves that bone. Makes it vibrate. Makes it vibrate. And then that, that's how the fish can hear the, uh, the sound that's come through the water. Because their bodies are, are soft, but that bone is dense. So once it hits that bone... Um, it cr- creates a vibration and allows them to hear it just like our eardrum vibrating. Okay. Okay. That's ex- it works the exact same way. It vibrates and it vibrates that bone in their head. Um, now where is this located? Like if I'm looking at a bass, yeah, uh, right? In front of the gills and behind the eyes. In front of the gills. <laughs> I mean, yeah. very small, not right noticeable in there. unless you know what you're looking You'd for. You'd have to dig it out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so it's pretty much kind of hidden. In it's the naked hidden eye. in there. You can't get it from the outside. You have to, if you want the bone out of there, you have to kill them. You Gotta have kill to the dissect fish. it out. Yeah. Okay. And how does that work in conjunction with the lateral line? Because like you always hear fishermen talk about the lateral line. They feel it. So now you've got feel and hear. How does that work together with a bass? Um, actually, w- what you'll find as well, um, a lot of fish, their hearing will go right in with their float bladder. And their float bladder is that little place, if you ever cleaned a fish, in between their backbone and their organs. Right. And a lot of our spotted bass fishermen will be very familiar with the float bladder because they'll blow up when they catch them under 30 feet of water in the wintertime. That float bladder, is com- the air is compressed inside of it, and it expands. Um, as they, if you pull them out from that deep spot, but that float bladder allows, uh, you'll see fish, it'll be tied kind of into their ear at the right at the front of the float bladder. And that float bladder helps them hear a little bit better. Now going to your question to the lateral line, it's a completely different sense. It runs down the side of the fish from the head all the way to the tail. It looks like a cup and it has some hairs that are inside it. And as water, as vibrations come through the water, it moves those hairs and it allows the fish to know what's going on around it. And fish use that lateral line system for a lot of different things, for locating prey, um, for just knowing what's around them. They also use it for schooling. Have you ever noticed how like a, you know, the schools of fish can turn all at the same time? That's their lateral line system. They're using that. So different, different sense, basically. Than- basically, yeah. It's basically like if you were at a concert and you know how you can feel the music and when you're close to the speakers, you can feel that vibration right. from there. A fish can feel another fish swimming by it like that. It can, it's very, very sensitive. And how does it tell? Does it go from, okay, I feel it, now that I hear it, now I see it? Is there an order of which? Because sometimes I've heard that a fish will just feel it and attack. Yeah. They know. I guess my question is, how do they know? They, um... Is it a frequency that it's they gonna know? Be, it's going to be a frequency, yeah. Now you're getting into, like, real theoretical stuff. <laughs> and that's fine. <laughs> but so. I can give you my opinion on it. Absolutely. That. Go ahead. Yeah. I think, like, spinnerbaits. I like spinnerbaits because they put off a vibration, right? Well, so does a fish swimming in the water. And I think if you can be around the same vibration as what they're feeding on, you have an advantage. So you're so you're basically saying, okay, let's <laughs> let's get deep here. Let's go down the rabbit hole. You said rabbit hole. Yeah. So you almost if in theory you knew that a thread fin shad gave off a frequency of X. Right. Not only could you match a bait to the size of it, you can match a bait to the frequency of it. X frequency. Right. And that's a theory that you think. Or is that pre- is that something you think is provable? Well, I think it's provable in a way because it kind of goes back to match the hatch. You know, how many times have you heard that? I've heard it a lot. Yeah. yeah. So um, if you're fishing in a lake that has shad and you're fishing a shad imitation, like a spinnerbait, you're going to get that pulsing. Well... Um, what happens when you change from a willow leaf to a Colorado blade? You're changing the frequency. 
changing the feel along the lateral line too and everything. Yeah. So switching blade sizes is going to give different vibrations off um, rattle traps. Or on the flip side of that, most of the lures, uh, especially your crankbaits these days, have rattles in them. So I'll intentionally buy the ones that don't. Okay, and why is that? Because they're different. Because they're different. <laughs> now, <clears throat> I, I, without... they're still giving off a frequency with the way they're moving through the water. The rattle is irrelevant to me. Well, without giving it away, we have a video coming up in which the angler that we are, you know, videoing speaks to that sometimes oh likes, really yeah he likes to go quiet i'm lucky it, am i yeah that's right <laughs> if, if they're not hitting it so you kind of match that but i think that's an interesting thing that you know i'm 48 years old i've never once even thought about the frequency of a bait yeah relative to what you're fishing with when i say the bait you know or thread fin what you're trying to mimic absolutely yeah i think it's really important yeah. and i um i think that has a lot more to do with those types of lures then has been proven. So you think that helps a fish at night, stuff like that, Absolutely. low level, muddy Absolutely. water. Absolutely. Um, the lateral line is so sensitive. They actually did it with Northern Pike on the study that I read. Um, they removed their eyes and their ears, but kept the fish alive, kept them in a tank and, you know, just fed them, fed them live fish, just like you'd feed any Northern Pike. And the Northern Pike could catch the fish with no eyes and ears, just based on its lateral line system, had no problem. Feeding. That's amazing. No problem. So I don't know how many people will listen to this and they'll be, you know, really paying a lot of attention to frequency, <laughs> you know, and in a year or two, we're going to have, you know, a frequency laden baits, you know, maybe we should patent it. We might should do it. I think so. <laughs> okay. So I've heard many times that a bass has no memory. A bass has a limited memory and a bass has an absolute indefinite memory like ours right all right what's your experience with that um a what's the book <laughs> okay so what, what's the book say what's the book say okay um well I, I can let's see how what's the best way to explain that okay i managed lakes for 20 years and a lot of what we did was increase the numbers of fish that could live in a pond now how do you do that you introduce energy and we introduce it in the form of feed. So if you put a feeder or you get a trash can full of feed and you go down and feed your fish every day, you're throwing food directly to your bluegill, which in most small lakes is your primary forage. They're getting bigger, and then that's in turn makes the bass bigger. But on your feed, on your on your lakes with your feeders, they come on every day at a certain time. Mm-hmm. And after, you know where I'm going with this, yes, after a certain amount of time, those bluegills start moving to that feeder about five, 10 minutes before it cuts on. They know. They get trained to it. Okay. So with that in mind, you can train a fish to eat, but you have to train it just like a dog. You have to do it every day. Okay. Okay. And as long as you do it every day, they'll come eat every day. If you stop feeding them, they'll forget. Okay. Okay. So now, is, it, is it more of a repetitive thing? Absolutely. It okay. needs to be done every day. Okay. okay. And once, it do, once it's done every day, they'll come and eat every day. Now, let's take that same pond and I don't care. Take any lure, just whatever, Rapala. And you go down there and you throw a Rapala in there every day and you start catching bass on it, right? You start catching bass on it. Well, if you keep using it every day, it stops working. You ever notice that? They figure out it hurts. If you can train a fish to eat, you can train a fish not to eat. Okay, that's your experience. That's what you're going with on that. Oh, yeah. Okay, so... It's called lure resistance, and that has been proven. Okay, lure resistance. Mm -hmm. Any uh, big a, studies on that or anything? Oh, yeah, I read a study out of University of Illinois back in early 2000s, um, which basically proves just that. Um, if you consistently fish a small body of water, or even Lake Lanier, I mean, there's lure resistance there, you know? Um, you go to some other reservoir where there's not as nearly as much fishing pressure and the fish are easier to catch. Am I wrong? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. It's so, cause they've been trained. There's so many fishermen throwing so many lures and catching them so many times it's conditioning the fish against the lures. So what I would do on my, my personal lakes that I was managing, if I was running into what I thought was that, because they would generally say things like, I've thrown every lure that Bass Pro has, and I can't catch a fish out here. And my answer to that would be stop. Stop. Stop fishing. 
give them a month. Let them forget about all that because they can't remember it forever. So if, it is limited. It is limited. And if you stop and just give your fish a break, they'll start biting again. Okay. Got a question from Travis Samples. We've discussed it on several of the podcasts, and it'd be nice to have a, a biological answer here. You hook a fish deep. Mm-hmm. Let's let's do it several different ways. Let's talk about first about if you hook one in the gills. Okay. Because you and I and are talking before this podcast, you mentioned something to me about fish bleeding. So let's yeah. go. You have hooked a fish in the gill. You let it go. What's going to happen to that fish and why? It's going to die. Uh, anytime you get them in the gills, it's not much different than stabbing somebody in the lung. They're not going to live. You know, if it's a nick, if it's just a small amount, they might be. But you know, when you get that red, it's just really pouring. That fish is, even though it swims away, um, it's it's low probability for survival. Let's put it that so way. So the mortality rate is, is extremely high. Yes, and we're talking in the gill. In the gill, when there's blood. Now, if you get them in the gill, like on the raker, you know, and, and you what can is get the, that and what out. is the raker? The gill rakers, eh, those little uh, the bones in the gill, mm-hmm. you know, and those little they have those little. little points that kind of hold the fish in there those gill rakers are there to protect the gill or anywhere in the arches of the gill if you get a hook in there and you get it out and you don't have any blood you're good to go okay but if we get lots of blood lots of blood it's any blood at all really you're probably dealing with less than 10 percent chances of survival might, I would guess. might as yeah. well take that you one might on. as well fry him up yeah he's okay. probably done all right now let's take it and let's talk about one that is hooked deep Almost in the gullet or whatever they want to call it. What is that? What is the terminology for that? I just call it gut hooked. Gut hooked. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So you, you've got it gut hooked where the hook is exposed, not buried yet. We'll get to that next. So now we got a deep hook. Exposed. Exposed. Okay. Now, one of those where, you know, I, I've seen people, and we probably did it in our youth, you just yank that joker. And yeah, that's it not pulls good. It right. Yeah. yeah. No, that's we, not. we grew up and figured that out. But that hook. Okay. That hook, I would go in from the gill side. Mm-hmm. and turn it around, try to get the eye pointing back down its throat, and try to do that all at the same time. And if if you practice it a little bit, you can get your finger down their throat, and you can, you can turn and get that out. Um, Higher mortality rate or, or better? It's more- hard to say because you can't see where it's injured. If it's, if it's all the way down, it's probably done. It's probably poked a hole in its stomach, and that's not going to heal. It's probably going to kill it. If it's exposed like you're talking about, it'll probably live. But you can't do that much damage getting it out. It really is how good the job the fisherman does getting that hook out. I, th- I think I've heard – I think it might have been Scott Barnes, something about clipping the – or it might have been Gene Jensen on our last podcast. talked about clipping off the barb and then pulling it back through. That's a smarter – that's a real smart way to do it, yeah. Okay. Well, if let, you can. If you can. Now let's yeah. get into in the stomach. And the reason I ask this is because the old saying that I've heard all my life was, if a fish has a hook swallowed, just cut the line, it'll rust itself out, and that fish will live. Yeah. Well, Again, it's hard to say because you don't know what it's done to the internal organs. It, did it go through the stomach? You know, is, yeah. it, is it poking into its intestines, or is it poking into someplace else? Um, or is it, is it just caught it someplace in the throat where it hasn't hit any vital organs? If it hasn't any vital organs, it'll be fine. It will rust out. But if it's hit vital organs, it's dead. It's not going to live. And there's just no way to tell. So the, if you're, if you've got one like that and you want to let it go, go ahead and let it go. It, it will rust out if it hasn't punctured anything. So it just depends on which way that barb's just a turn. Just complete luck. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, you might've mentioned it earlier with the spotted bass. You mentioned the air bladder. Mm-hmm. Okay, and a lot of these lakes up here in North Georgia are deep. Even the local reservoir here, Latham, mm-hmm. it's 100 foot deep. You can catch spots over 60 foot of water. They'll suspend in sure. 30, foot of, uh, 30 or 40 foot of water, and um, you have to fizz them. Yep. That's, that's, that's the terminology. Now, I'd like you to explain the science behind the air bladder, what causes the air bladder to expand, okay. and what your thoughts are with fizzing. If it's good, if it's bad, will the fish live? Because we've heard some conflicting stuff here oh, sure. in the last month. So what is the official book on Okay, so on what's that? happening there is not different than a diver getting the bends. Okay, you're down. You're 30, well, it's 30 feet at the line. Once you get under 30 feet, you're going to start having this problem. If your fish are shallower than that, it's just not deep enough. not enough pressure on them. But the, there's so much pressure. And what the float bladder does is you see a bluegill just sit like this, right? 
it doesn't it's not swimming so a bluegill has it too sure bluegill okay. have them bass have them trout have them um most fish have them and it allows them to do this it gives them that neutral buoyancy like a diver you know how the diver adds weights to go down and like that okay right. so the float bladder is in there it's it's like a balloon inside of it and it just gives them ability to sit there so they don't have to swim all the time. It gives them that balance, okay? Almost like they could just hover. Yep. Right in that spot. Yep. They okay. just got a little balloon inside their body there. Now, on your on your bass, say, that goes in. Um, there's not an opening like in a trout. A trout has a hole. A trout can gulp air and put air in its float bladder. It can also belch air and take air out. Oh, okay. A, I didn't know a that. A bass can't do that. A bass, it has to go through its bloodstream. It has to work its way out and then go out. It actually all end up going out through the gill is what it actually ends up happening. When the blood gets into the gill, um, it's like, just like osmosis, it moves from an area of high concentration to low concentration. That gas moves its way out. And it and takes that's how, time that's, that's for how a they bass. Release it, though. Yeah. That's, it, okay. it, so if you pull, if a bass is under 30 feet, and it wants to come up, it has to do it like a diver. It has to come up in stages and let that let that ex- compressed gas kind of escape their body. And then once they get up and get that gas out, they're good to go. They can operate, operate, you know, in the, in the shallower waters. Okay. Um, but so let's say you do catch a bass at um, 30 feet or 35 feet, and it blows up on you. You know, you pulled him up. So you pulled him up too fast, faster than he can actually naturally yep. expel it out. Yeah. So his now that, that pressure's gone and that gas expands and the fish can't dive back down. It really restricts them. Um, Which is why you see it floating sideways in the live well. Yep. It's basically like it's tied to a buoy. It's, okay. it's an own natural buoy, but it's, it's stuck now. Um, and that's not good for it too either because now the, something inside its body has expanded – way bigger than it's supposed to. It's putting pressure on its internal organs. You know, it's not good for the fish at all. So you would want to, you know, lance that like you talked about. Get the air, get go in. Um, I'm sure there's a million YouTube videos on how to do it right. Use a syringe. Um, you really want to work on your technique on that if you're going to be doing that because you don't want, again, you don't want to get into the belly. You don't want to pierce through that float bladder and then into the organs. That'll kill the fish. But as long as you go in through the meat, Get into the float bladder and let that air out. Let the fish back. It'll heal. It'll be fine. Okay, because we've heard that if you let it go, that fish was going to die in six months because it never heals. You're saying it, it will heal. It will heal, yeah. Okay, what about the um, – what, what is the better way to do it, through the mouth or through the side? Or does it really matter? I don't think it matters. Whatever you're best at, whatever, you know, what, whatever what, you're most comfortable with. What gives you the less chance of poking an internal organ in your mind? I like going through the back a little bit better. Okay. Yeah. Um, you can kind of feel it. it. It has tension, tension, tension. And once it gets in there, you can kind of feel it poke, pop it g- through. It gives a little bit. Yeah, it just it's, you can feel it once you get the technique for it. And the air, really what you can do is you can see it. You know, it goes down like a balloon. You, know, right. you can hear it come out. Um, but, yeah, that that's to me, I like it on, through the back a little bit better than through the mouth. Okay. We had a, uh, a gentleman in, a, in a, one of our fellow anglers in a tournament. For some reason, Josh and I had one of these. We we had a fizzer on the boat, and I don't know why. I guess normally because our boat turns into like a tornado hits it once we start tournament fishing. For some <laughs> reason, everything we own is spread out. We couldn't find the fizzer. Yeah. So a, a co, a angler and his co-angler came by, and we asked them, do you have a fizzer? And, you know, they were talking about, but he also had these things, these little weights with little clips mm-hmm. that you hook to the anal gland mm-hmm. or the anal fin, anal gland, anal fin, and another one that keeps the fish naturally oh, really? turned like this. That's interesting. I haven't seen that. I haven't seen one either before, uh-uh. but eventually, I guess, the fish works itself. Sure. And and, and that, what you're saying is the reason that it, it lives now is because it's had time to get that air out. Yeah. Naturally. It basically has to exhale all that air, extra air out. And why can't it do it while it's laid on its side? Why? Cause I've heard that the fish is going to die if it doesn't happen. Or, yeah. It generally will. It takes them a long time for that to happen. And I don't know that that thing will work, but I don't, I don't know what keeping them upright has anything different. It has. So you think it's it, the pressure on the internal organs that really concerns me more than them okay. not being able to get down to eat. 
Okay, so we're yeah. talking about in a, and I think the reality of that is in a tournament situation, keeping it alive long enough to weigh it in so you don't get a dead fish penalty. Right. So what you're saying is it's better to fizz that fish than to use these weights because I would because of pressure on the fish. Yeah, it's not good for them. Okay, well, that, I mean that that makes perfect sense. So, mm-hmm. all right, now let's talk eyesight, the eyesight of a largemouth bass and even a spotted bass. Kind of give me a, a first question: the range of sight in, say, clear water. How good are their eyes? Just like ours. Just like ours. Just like ours with a, uh, you know, like a swim goggles or whatever on. They they're very similar. The, the eye structures work very similarly. Um, so it's going to be limited to visibility, and and uh, fisheries terminology we use a little. Uh, it's called a secchi disc, S E C C. H-I, I think, or S-E-C-C-I. It's one of that secchi disc. It's a white disc and a black disc. It's, it's half white, half black, and you lower it in the water. And you literally just put it down until you can't see it anymore and, and record that depth. Um, fish are going to, they're not going to be any different than us. They're going to be able to see about that distance in the water. Okay. Yeah. Same eye structure, like not, you know, white-tailed Rods, deer is cones, totally, everything, yep. cones is the same. Yep. Um, now your predatory fish are going to have, um, a few more rods in there for, for night vision type stuff. Uh, the thing about vision on the fish is, I guess the most complex thing to think of is they're in a medium. So it's kind of like us being in a fog, you know, there's, there's going to be floating particles in the water, right? And those floating particles, if they're plankton, it's going to give the water a green color. If they're dirt, it's going to give it a brown color. If you're in South Georgia, it'll give it a black color, that tannic acid, you know. Right. Um, and here's, I, I like this, I, no one ever gets this one right, the most visible color in water. Everybody asked me that question. I was getting ready, I was getting ready to ask it because you and I talked about it before yeah. this. So. Um, I'll just cut to the chase. Um, the most visible color in water is the color of the water. And it works like this. Your, how does your vision work? Okay, I'm looking at this microphone. It's a black microphone. So that microphone is absorbing every single color except for black. Black is being reflected off, going back into my eye. My brain processes that and tells me that's a black microphone. Right. Okay. So it's absorbing everything. Now we go back to that medium that we were talking about because the fish are suspended in that, right? Let's say the water's green. That means every single color is being absorbed by the water except for green. Therefore, some color of green is the most visible color in green water. And this is how, this is by the books. This is by the books. By the books. And I can prove it to you too. The next time you're in a real foggy um, situation, you know that white white out kind of fog. Check and see: is it easier to see a white truck or a black one? It's always easier to see a white truck in the fog. Really? Mm-hmm. And is, is it just the way our brain processes? It's just the just... way it's just reflective. It's just the way physics is. Okay, so now we're getting physics in, in the <laughs> yeah. It's so, the way your eye works. So we've got, so we've got frequencies, <laughs> bank frequencies, and now we're doing physics. So you're saying, and I'm going to use Latham because it's close to here. Sure. Uh, it, it has a greenish, last time we were fishing it, it had a very greenish tint. Mm-hmm. So we're going to assume plankton type life in yep. the water. Yep. So if I were fishing it, Green, green pumpkin, something of that color will be the most visible color to a fish in that water. Correct. Which means that, I mean, it's pretty good because green works pretty good over there. Okay. And it doesn't mean mean that the fish are always going to bite that color. It's just what they can see the best. Right. And on the, I usually defer to those types of things on the, on the tough days, you know, when I'm, I'm, when I'm not getting a lot of bites. I'll start matching color, water color, and doing that, and, and doing the opposite. You know, what's the opposite of green? Or you know, go black, go white, go chartreuse. You know, go all over the place. But if I'm having a tough day, I'm I'm always matching water color to lure color. And how does that work? Just down in South Georgia with the tannic black, Just fit black lures and black water. Makes a little bit of sense. <laughs> I have not heard that, so that's a, that's pretty good because I guarantee you... Biggest fish I ever caught was that way. Well, here's what I'm going to do, and people are going to listen to this. 
maybe tonight when we get home, we're going to put a poll out. <laughs> we're going to put a poll out and ask the people on, on Fish North Georgia, what is the most visible color? We will ask this question. And so by the time we get this podcast to air, um, we will have time to have you know, gotten yeah. some very good answers. That's what Dr. Reiner taught us at Georgia. So uh, no one's ever repeated that to me either. I've, I've asked that question to a lot of fishermen. No one's ever given me that answer back. Well, I would have never, I would have <laughs> never said the color of the water yeah. is the most visible color to a fish in that water. Yep, sure is. And now that's true up to about, you know, once you get down to about 25 feet, everything's black down there. You know, it's dark. Which leads into another question about vision. Why are we throwing chartreuse colored baits deep stuff like that if if, if the it light works. well but if the light is gone and you say pretty much everything's black what makes the bass see that chartreuse or how about just a worm with a chartreuse tail what is it about that you know i can see it up shallow maybe but down deep um that's a great question and again I mean, once you get to a certain depth it's all black you know it's all dark down there um, and so then now they're relying more on their ear bone and their lateral line. They're going to be, yeah, they're definitely going to be relying on their Back lateral to frequency. Line. Back to that frequency, sure. This is like conspiracy theories. <laughs> fishing conspiracy theories. I'm loving but it. But if I'm fishing in 30 feet of water, I will use black worms a lot just because it doesn't really matter. So no sense in going out and buying that color worm? Not necessarily. I mean, like Lake Lanier, you've got, uh, you know, you've got a lot of good water clarity down there. You know, you, you're going to get light penetration a little bit further in your clear water lakes than in your, like your stain lakes. Okay. Um, so that will make a little bit of difference. But also, too, you have to consider what's the surface of the water look like. Is it choppy? Is it clear? And why um, is that important? Well, think about it, you know. The light is going to be refracted. It's almost going to look like a strobe light with a chop on the water, right? It's going to give it a different quality than if the water was just flat calm. It's not going to be reflect, refracting the light in, in that way. And we're still talking deep, fish that are down deep. Any, any depth, really. Okay. Um, and, and you'll see bass, uh, you know, use their use their specialized rods and cones in their eyes for that limited light. Their, their eyes, predatory fish's eyes are really set up to, at, for dawn and dusk type situations. It gives them an advantage, and they use that advantage. Um, but the light is going to change depending on cloud cover, sunny or not, you know. It's going to change on how, it's, how, the, how windy it is. Um, it's going to change on how much rain you've had. How many particles do you have in your water? You know, what's the turbidity of the water? Uh, if it's just muddy water, you're not going to get a whole lot of light very deep, you know? And I mean, I don't really worry about colors too much in muddy water. I'll go with my chartreuse sometimes and I'll go with my browns. That's about it. Okay. So, and it makes sense. So back to that's what colors they can see. Yeah in the water and all like that. Now we're talking bass. Now I imagine if we really wanted to get into it with trout and stuff, that all changes a little bit. Or does that say the same? Well, you know, you're still dealing with predatory fish, you know, their, right. their eyes are going to be similar. They're going to be a little bit better for low light conditions than say like a, you know, a bait fish of some kind. Um, their eyes are going to be set up differently. Um, there'll be more cones and, and fish like say that are on a, uh, a coral reef, you know, where the colors are more important and seeing different colors and the fish and stuff. Uh, they're, they're, those fish will be set up to see better color than, say, a bass. But uh, a bass is definitely can see color. Okay. All right. Now let's talk about uh, Shane Dover gave me another question. He's going to love me mentioning his name. You'll have to meet Shane one day. He's a, he's a really good guy. Uh, he would love to fish with you and pick your brain because he's a jig fisherman <laughs> when it comes to these jig colors. And he, he studied crawfish and stuff and how they their colors are different through the year and all sure, that sure yeah so he's real big on the color thing like that but he asked a good question the spawn catching females mm. i would assume probably not keeping them maybe he was asking if, if you keep them but how about just catching them in general how does that affect a fishery and let's start with a pond and move up to say we won't even, you can get to Lake Lanier if you want to go that big, but say a pond to a reservoir, three or four or 500 acres and then so forth. Uh, if you get some heavy fishing during the spawn. I don't worry about it. That yeah. doesn't hurt them. Uh, I've never really been in a situation where I can say that, oh, wow, the fishermen have really messed up the bass reproduction. Most of the lakes that I shock are bass heavy and they need to be harvested. So if I could get some limited 
bass reproduction on some of the places, I would be happy to have it because I don't want those fish coming in every year. It makes my life hard. Um, I would not worry about that at all. You can catch a bass off a of bed, put it back, she'll go right back to that bed and be fine. So you're saying that it, that the stress, there's no undue stress as far as, I mean, I mean, if even, even if it was, it doesn't matter. Eh, nah, I, I, they, in here where we live uh, in the Southeast, I, I am not worried about bass re- reproducing. Let's put it that way. I, I, unless you've got a crappy problem or something, you know, it's inhibiting it that way. But as far as them just making babies, the fishermen aren't really hurting them that much. If you're pulling them off the beds left and right and keeping them, you know, that's not helping them out. But nobody keeps any bass anyway, so it doesn't matter. Well, that's, that, that's true. <laughs> that is true. So, all right. So let's take that and go into tournament fishing. Sometimes it's it's said that catching a bass off a of bed, taking it to the weigh-in, and then releasing it there, oh yeah, is is, is bad for the fish. How for the it, reproduction wise, I guess. So. Yeah. Um, I really wouldn't worry too much about that either because. Uh, they're probably just going to lay more eggs and spawn again uh, if they can't get back to their nest, if, they, if they're taken so far away. And I have seen studies on big reservoirs like Lanier where about 50% of the fish that are caught from anywhere in the lake return to that spot within a couple of weeks. Um, so it's very possible they could just simply swim back over there to their nest and get right back on it. It just depends on how far you move them. Right. Um, but they, they know where they are, and they can go back. Okay. I, that's something to consider. Now, what about the um, – how do I want to put it? Morals is not the right right word to use. It's kind of like some people look down on guys – that catch bass in these tournaments when they're on bed. Like on it's, bed like that, yeah. Like it's, it's a thing. But after listening to you for a little bit, you're like, they need to take some bass out of the lake anyway. Usually, so. yeah. It depends on the population of the of the fishery, you know. Um, I wouldn't want to say it's, you know, the worst thing you could do or the best thing you could do. But I don't frown upon those guys so much. If you can catch a bass off the bed, go ahead. It's not going to hurt the fishery. We got plenty of bass, plenty of reproduction. I don't really, that, that doesn't really bother me. Okay. What about summertime fishing? A lot of the tournaments have gone from five fish mostly through the year to three fish because it's harder to keep them alive, which is going to lead into us talking about fish care in a second. Mm -hmm. Um, Any opinions on that? Or again, you're like, well, you probably need to take some fish out anyway. Yeah, usually. um, If it's a bass heavy place, you definitely want the mortality is good for the lake. Um, Which is different than everything we hear out there. Oh, I know. Well, it, you know, catch and release is great. You know, if you're talking about a place like like Commerce Reservoir, you know, where there are it's a light bass population in there. I'm never going to keep a bass out of that place. I'm always going to return the fish there because they need to be in there. There's just not that many. But on the flip side of that, if I go to Bear Creek, I'm keeping everything I catch. And Bear Creek is where. It's over uh, East Jackson near Athens. It's about a 500 acre reservoir over there, and it's it's. The last I read from the fisheries studies, it's 2013. It was pretty bass heavy. Okay. Um, so if I get hook mortality in a place like that, I am not worried about those fish. They, they need to be harvested. And I'm not sure if we covered it or not, but you and I had talked definitely off air about when we were talking relative weight, that you had come up with something that would go like on a golden rule to help a fisherman or help fishermen kind of – gauge the lake yeah um understanding the balance of your pond is important and understanding the balance of a of a of the fishery even a big like like bear creek over there if you had a a tournament out there say um i'd want to know that it's bass heavy and how i know how do i know that well i compare it to the average so i start catching fish and i look at that chart and i have a, a a scale that i use and it just basically gives the, the length of the fish across the top and the average weight across the bottom. So I can look at it real quickly and say, you know, like we talked about, 24 inches should be 8 pounds. Um, so, so if, if you, I, yeah. I, can, I can use that scale and say, all right, this fish should be 8 pounds. Then I put it on a scale, it weighs 9, that gives me information. If it weighs 6, that gives me information. Okay. Um, and how come nobody talks about this? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm being <laughs> I very. I've never heard it even discussed, and I'm around some really good fishermen. 
Yeah, and, I think nobody talks. That's about a great that. question, and I used to t- tell my clients like this. Um, this is a lot like NASCAR, what we're talking about in a way. Fishermen are like drivers, and I'm like the mechanic. Okay. Mechanics don't drive. Mechanics fix. Right. Drivers drive. So your bass fishermen are going around real fast, driving around, catching these fish. Okay? That has nothing to do with putting the engine together. You know what I mean? Right. So if you look at it that way, you uh, you see the difference. You know, you, I can't sit here and give you a lot of tips on how to catch fish at Lake Lanier. I don't know them. You know, I'm not that type of fisherman. You know, I don't, I can could tell you a couple things that I do that caught fish once. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but yeah, I, but I can tell you, you know, about fisheries populations and dynamics and what to look for to clue yourself in. Um, going back to the Bass Heavy, we could talk about, you know, how would you game plan if you know you're going to Bear Creek and you know it's a Bass Heavy pond? or reservoir how would you game plan that well let's do it let's go let's go there all right so the first thing i know is there's too many bass and they're all going to be about 12 inches long sounds like cedar creek doesn't it yeah cedar creek and then i'm going to look on my chart on my scale and i'm going to say all right i'm catching 12 and a half inch fish that weigh three quarters of a pound they should weigh a pound so i and i've done that consistently you know i've caught 10 15 however many you just track it you know keep an eye on it and you've just, you've determined all right. There's too many bass in here. It's it's a definitely it looks like a bass heavy fishery, but we're in the middle of a tournament, and we want to try to catch a kicker. Well, what I would do in that situation is start fishing with something that looks like a eight inch bass, a jerk bait, a glide bait. Your bigger bass are going to key on the most available forage, the most readily available forage there. It doesn't matter what the fish species are. And if the most readily available thing to eat is a bass, then that's what those big fish are going to be eating. Bass eating bass. Bass eating bass. And in fact, we don't even really measure. We were taught in school, don't even really worry about the fish that are under 10 inches on on your largemouth, the weights. They're usually always way right. And they're probably not going to live till next year anyway. Because they're going to get eaten. They're going to get eaten. Really? Nobody thinks about that. Yeah. Um, I, I think about that when I fish with jerk baits. Everybody's right. like, oh, it's a minnow imitation. And a minnow, I said, it's not a minnow imitation. It's a bass imitation. Because that's what they normally eat. Mm-hmm. So I'll go uh, in a bass heavy lake like Bear Creek. I'm definitely going to keep like a, a, a profile. I'm, I'm looking for a fish that not only has the colors of a bass, but also that long, skinny profile of the bait. You know, and I might even change the colors of the bait. It might be chartreuse. It might be something crazy, but the The, profile is very important. That long, narrow, if I'm trying to catch a kicker, I want something that looks very much like a bass. If I'm in a lake with a lot of gizzard shad, I want something that looks like a gizzard shad. Right. The profile and the color. That's very important. And that's for your kicker. Go catch your, go catch your limit of 12 inch fish and look for that kicker. Um, there was a pond that we did some work on at Georgia. Um, it was down in, it's down near the nuclear power plant down there. And it was a 750 acre impoundment that had no fishing pressure. They wouldn't let anybody on the plant to, to fish it. And then they left it alone. Nobody ever touched it. And a guy did a, a PhD on, um, uh, it was like heavily fished, moderately fished, not fished and compared the catch rates and uh it was it was interesting it was a situation where you could throw about 30 casts in a row and catch 30 bass in a row because they'd never seen nothing they had like never it. seen any kind of lures they'd never had any kind of pressure they just jumped all over everything and hit the water right but it was extremely bass heavy and there was two sizes of bass there was 12 inches and there was fish that could eat 12 inches again back to that two sizes yep so again, if I'm in a bass heavy impoundment and I've figured that out, I'm definitely want to keep some bigger baits, some eight inch, 10 inch glide baits. You know, I want to fish with bigger things, even, uh, bigger crank baits that look like, um, bluegill because, uh, a bass heavy pond is a trophy bluegill pond. You're limiting the numbers of bluegill. Therefore, the ones that are there have plenty to eat, and they grow to trophy sizes if they don't get eaten. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Now I'm going to throw a lake at you. I don't know if you've ever fished it. But Yahula Reservoir up in Dahlonega. 
Never you been there. Okay. No. So we're talking maybe 100 acres. Okay. Uh, fairly shallow compared to most lakes around there. Now, you can go catch 12-inch fish, lots of them. Now, most tournaments there will be, especially during the summer as it warms up, will be five fish and 6.28 pounds wins the tournament. Right. Now, a lot of guys that fished it a long time ago say it used to be full of big bass. Mm -hmm. Now they have said that people keeping them have brought that out, you know, fishing pressure, whatever. But it's really hard to catch a quality fish. You'll see one every once in a while. Mm -hmm. But do you think that a lake that size could have something to do with the fishing pressure? Or are we back to that lake's probably got the big fish they're eating those 12 inch fish were we back to that something like that because there's no there's no forage really other than bluegill yeah maybe a little perch crappy in that i mean just your standard fish there's no thread fin nothing like that right right so do you think that would be something i that sounds very much like a bass heavy impoundment they're they've stunted there's just too many bass and there's just not enough there's just not enough forage coming off there's enough to keep them alive there's right. not enough to keep them growing. And that's just a guess with you never having even seen it. Never having yeah. seen it and just knowing that 90% of the places that I put in a shocking boat in the water, we're telling them to harvest bass. Okay. So you think even though all the locals will say people keep the fish out here all the time, you're saying it probably needs to take a few more out. Yeah, it would be with, the with other that, way. Without no, I mean, without knowing, of course. Based on my shocking experience, it's going to go the other way. Um, if you've got a situation where people are over harvesting the fish, uh -huh. it's going to be, you're never going to catch a bass, right? The bass population is going to be light, right? It's not going to be many fish. So now what does that mean though? That means each individual fish has plenty of food and they're going to be bigger. So if it was an over harvest situation, you would see big bass, not a bunch of small ones. Very similar to commerce. Very similar to commerce. Exactly like commerce. That's what I was wanting to hear you say, <laughs> yeah. because I'm trying to put two to two together in my brain up here and, and thinking, I go over there and catch little fish all day long. Mm -hmm. Or at least, you know, Josh and I are very good at catching little fish. I don't know what the rest of them are doing, but for the most part, that's what we see. Yep. You're looking 12, 13 inch fish, but that makes sense. If it were over harvested, the fish we would catch would, would be, be huge. Fewer numbers. Bigger sizes. Bigger sizes. Yeah. Okay. It sounds like they're stunted and stuck, but... In every single bass-heavy pond I've ever been in, there's always some bass that get lucky and get bigger. Right, because we see that occasionally. We'll it see a seven-pounder happen, four-pounder here. Mm -hmm. But the average fish on that lake is 12 and a half, 13 inches. And everybody All that fishes long. these tournaments know it. So that would be your take. We're just going on what the fishermen are telling you as far as catch rates, mm -hmm. you're going to this lake blind. you got to try to fix it. Your first thing is, given the information that you're telling me, we need to keep some fish. That's what that sounds like. And I would back that up with just go to the next fishing tournament and take the lengths and measurements there and compare them to the relative weight. And when you see that they're all underweight, there's your answer. So that might be something we need to do too. And how do you, how can we get, or is there something that you, I think you mentioned. That yeah, you I've got be. them. I've, I, they're like five bucks. I got little, uh, little scales that uh, people can use. I use them. I used it for work. I came up with it. Um, and it's just a quick reference guide. Um, and, and how can somebody that wants one of these things get it from you? Oh, just email me. Just email you? Okay. Yeah. And we, we, what we'll do is at the end of this podcast, we will um, put out your email like that. Okay. So if you get inundated, you know. Oh, yeah. I'll probably, I'm sure I'll get run over with maybe, bass but, scales. <laughs> but still, that's very interesting to it have. It is. I, like, I just like doing it. It, it, uh, it. It's the information that you gain from it. If you know how to think about it will give you insight. And if you don't know how to think about it, it's pointless information. Right. You know, well, we, we do fish with some very smart guys that do think they'll about things figure like, that out pretty quick. You right. know what I mean? And you'll figure it out too. Like when you get into those situations where the bass population is balanced or maybe there's maybe crappy have caused a problem and there's fewer bass in the lake than should be. The first thing you're going to see in that situation is the crappy are going to be the same size. And they're going to be across about, the board about yeah. this big, <laughs> about the size of your hand, about the size of your hand, maybe a little bit smaller. And there's going to be more than you care to and, keep count or eat. And again, we're still talking about, and you don't catch many bass, but when you do, you catch a, a real nice heavy one, you know, but if you could take some of these crappy out, that would help the bass as well. I always harvested every crappy I ever shocked up. 
you know, I remember now from being younger, my dad always said, my grandfather too, on the little lake. Did you ever come fish that little lake behind our house back in the day? I probably did. You probably <laughs> did. Um, I don't know if I told everybody that we kind of grew up together back in the day. We, yeah. we, we fished. We ran in the same circles. But my grandfather and my dad always said, if you catch crappy, if nothing else, throw them on the bank. Yep. Just get it. Because we only had like an acre lake. It was just yeah. a little small. But we had some really big bass. But they hated the crappie. Yeah. Unless we were eating them. Mm-hmm. You know, and everybody loves to eat crappie. They're good eating fish. Oh, but, great. you know, I've heard, I don't know how many times, just get it out of the water. It is. Yeah. Get them out of there. They're, again, they, they just eat bass fry. Just eat bass fry. And they eat, what, they eat what bass want to eat and they eat what bluegill want to eat. So they're, they compete with everything in the lake for food. Yeah. They just a little bit of everything. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's mm-hmm. right. Let's do this. Let's get into the handling of a bass okay because you and i had some pretty good conversations already about that let's talk first about you have, you've set the hook on a fish and you are reeling it in the proper way to support a bass hold a bass take a bass out of the water sure in your eyes okay um i see it on the youtube a lot and it drives me crazy I know, it, I know it does. I know it does. <laughs> it drives you crazy. Um, they they grab the fish and they crank it like this. So the the lip is here and the body's almost is flat to the water this way. Right. They're holding okay. it horizontal as yeah, far, instead, of instead, of, instead of vertical. That's a big no-no. If you do that on one of my lakes, you're going to be asked to leave. And that is why. Um, the jaw muscle and the cartilage and, and everything in that joint is so important to a bass it's like their life they they literally have to have it to survive and by taking it and wrenching it like this you're putting all that fish's weight right on those two jaws right on those two joints right and the bigger the fish is the heart the more pressure you're putting on that jaw so again i think it's a condition of bass heavy situations people are used to catching small fish and you can take a 12 inch fish and do like that all day it's not going to break its jaw you do it to a seven pound fish it's going to bust it and now that fish can't eat and it's going to die and people don't even think about that no they don't so the proper way to handle a fish i don't even like hanging them by their jaw especially if they get over 10 pounds um i'd rather weigh it i've even got a net that actually you just lift it out of the water and it'll weigh it in the net that's my favorite. But if I have to get it out of the water, always support. You always lip it here and support the stomach right there by the base, you know, right in there. And that, that's a good way to support its internal organs. Uh, it helps it a little bit. But always use two hands, especially on your big fish. Don't wrench them like that. Do not do that. Um, don't lay them on the ground. Don't lay them in the dirt. It gets our slime coat off there. And I actually don't even like touching them with my hands. Uh, and if I have to touch them with my hands, I always wet them. It helps. It helps keep the slime on the fish. And I know you've seen it. And I've had people ask me over the years, they send me pictures of fish. It has black. Right. Start paying attention to those black marks on the fish. It's always a handprint. You can see the fingers. You can see the palm. And what somebody does is they touch that fish with dry hands and it peels all of their slime coat off. They put that fish back in the water and a bacterial infection gets in their skin and turns it black. It'll stay black forever. It won't hurt the fish. It's kind of like a tattoo. Um, but you can tell that but you can tell that it's, somebody it's that. been handled and you, it's usually right across the middle of the back where they grabbed them like that with a dry hand. Okay. Um, well, what about this? What about in kayak fishing though, in these tournaments where they're laying the fish on the golden rule to take a picture of the length? Again, now you've got support along the whole underside of the fish. But it doesn't hurt the slime coat as much if you... Again, I want to wet the scale. You know, I want to keep everything as wet as possible that the fish is going to touch. So I don't really okay, mind the scale as much as I do somebody who just lays it on the ground in the dirt. That gotcha. drives me crazy, too. So, But a good thing for these kayak fishermen or people that do those kind of tournaments where you're taking a picture of length tournament, just maybe just wet, wet it. it. Maybe. And then, um, just a precaution. Oh, to a little help. handful of water wet. Just wet that thing down so it's, it's not completely dry, and uh, the fish will be fine. Okay. So, uh, but, it, you know, vertical holding, you don't – it's not as bad. It's okay. Okay. But I, not, I really, like, if I'm, if I'm holding a fish in my kayak, I'm holding it like this. It's down in the water. 
It's coming out of the water to the scale. It's going right back into the water in a way. I'm okay. getting rid of it as fast as I can, and I don't want to suspend it off its jaw. I don't want it shaking. You know, I don't. I don't want it. I want to be as careful with that fish as I can be. Okay. Um, especially my big fish. You know, my right. five, six, eight, ten pound fish. Um, they're not going to get to thirteen pounds with a sprained jaw. Cause can't eat. That's it. Makes sense. Okay, let's talk about bass tournaments. So now we're we're talking. We're bringing in the live well. Bringing in the live well. Now okay. let's just talk about. All right, you caught a you, you caught a fish early, right? Right. A nice fish. Second cast of the second day. cast of the day. You got eight and a half in the tank. Right. You got to keep that alive. And you got a small tank and a big fish. Right. And then you start adding more fish to it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Or so, we hope anyway. Right. right. All right. Let's just say we do. Okay. Say we got a 30 pound stringer in there and we got it all at 8 30. Now yeah. we're just waiting for the tournament to end, right? Right. Yeah. So, but we got to keep our fish alive. First thing you need is either one of those, uh, you know, products that they make uh, to you know, save the fish in the live well that turns the water blue. You know, all of those things are is salt. Okay. Um, so why not just use salt? You can. Just use some rock salt. Don't use iodized salt. Don't Why use not? table salt. The iodine is bad for them. Okay, so rock salt good. Rock table salt, salt bad. bad. Yeah, don't use that. What is mixed in with the other stuff that turns the water blue? Is oh, just... uh, coloring and um, they got some stuff that helps the slime coat and you know a couple other things and little additives in there and everything. But it's mostly just salt. Okay. And like when we run them from the fish hatchery, you know, stocking thousands of fish into lakes and stuff, we always just use it's just bulk salt. Okay, it's non iodized bulk salt. Is there how much salt? Let's just say your typical live well, just a handful. Yeah, throw okay. it in there. Can now, you put, do you have the live well that's flushing water all the time? Well, let's we fish electric only, so let's do this. We have a live well. A lot of guys use coolers. Okay, sure. So let's let's just take the cooler situation. Right, we got a first. cooler um, because that's harder for these guys, pretty much. You know, are you running compressed air or just a regular bilge pump? We're going to go regular bilge pump because most of the people that run compressed air are we're talking big bass boats, big lakes. So okay. on an electric only, that's a very rare thing. In fact, I've never seen compressed air. Not really? saying it's not there, okay. but most people are just running a straight, you know, put the water in circ- uh, with a little circulating pump. Well, I'll get you set up with some compressed air. She- okay. Real cheap. You're going to want you that. That's right. nice. There you go. Um, okay. So you need to keep your water circulating. Okay. Um, you need to keep that air running all the time. It can't, it can't switch off because the bass is, is taking the oxygen out of the water like a sponge and it's even doing it at a faster rate than normal because it's under stress. Okay. Right. It's been taken out of its home. It's been stuck in your boat. It's stressed out. And what happens is, is, is freshwater fish, um, just by nature, by, of being freshwater fish pee a lot. Okay. A lot, a lot. And it's because the water goes across the membrane in their gill into their system. Their kidneys have to excrete, excrete that extra water that's constantly passing in while they breathe. So they just pee all the time, like 20% of their weight a day. Really? Yeah. That's, that's a lot. lot. You don't ever think, I, I'm <laughs> sorry, I've never once thought about a fish peeing because it's in water. Right. Well, what happens then if it's in your live well, your live well starts getting full of ammonia. Okay. And that's what that salt helps combat, that ammonia. All right, so there you go. That's a tip. There and uh, that what we're talking about is osmoregulation. And osmoregulation is a term we use to describe the internal salt balance on a fish. The internal salt balance. Right. Because you have to remember that gill, it, it's releasing stuff into the water all the time, like through osmosis, because it's such a thin membrane. For oxygen to be able to pass across and get into the blood, other things are leaving. And part of what's leaving is salt. So it gets like uh, like a runner. You know, you've seen a runner collapse because their uh, electrolytes get low. Right, yes. A, fat, a bass will do the same thing under stress. It'll collapse. It'll die because it's basically peed all the salt out of the system. is low on electrolytes. So the salt we're just putting in the water, which goes right back in through the gill, which gives us electrolytes back. And it's staggering how much better survival you get out of fish with salt. It's like a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Like, oh, you could, the studies I saw with bluegill were like, you know, if you let the bluegill in the tank too long, like, you know, 20% live, you add salt to the same water, 
95 percent live really yeah so they need some gatorade just a little bit of salt will help every time salt every time yep and that'll keep your fit that'll just having a little salt in there and uh, and flushing your tank don't leave your don't leave your cooler full of water all day add some new water a couple times a day and get that ammonia out and it gets that fresh water in and every time you add fresh water add a little bit of salt to it and you'll be fine that's some good that's some good tips now what about caring for the cooler or the live well after a tournament you've you've released a fish ammonia on the wall i mean is it something that sticks just rinse just, it out just rinse it out yeah nothing, nothing special you gotta yeah. do and don't use tap water tap water has chlorine it'll kill fish fast you don't ever fill your you know use lake water to fill your your live wells and, up and why is that i mean what what does the chlorine do oh the chlorine is just toxic to them just toxic yeah it just straight up kills them i mean like in 10 seconds it kills them really mm-hmm. so somebody at home filling up with a water hose before unless they're on a well yeah. Big no no. Big no no. Okay, Shan, I got one more question before we wrap it up. Um for the average fisherman, okay, going out to a lake such as Yahula or, or really any lake, is there something that they can do or what would you suggest they do? Um either big picture with within the, the government or as an individual or anything they do that can improve their fisheries. Any suggestions, you know, tips like that, just just from a individual standpoint, maybe even up into up through the the ranks. I think that's a good one. Um, I think probably learning the biology of the bait fish that you're fishing after, you know, that are in your lakes. Um, for example, do you know when threadfin shad spawn? Most don't. Most don't. I can tell you it's at daybreak. When the water temperature's probably above 60 degrees or so, they start around 60, 65, depends on the lake and where you're at. But, um, and they go to the edges, they go to the grass, they like the aquatic vegetation, and they like it at sunup. Just, that's just the way they are. So go learn the biology of gizzard shad, of threadfin shad, of bluegill, the spawning habits. And... I think that's probably the difference between what I know and what the average person knows is with all my shocking experience and, and the fact that I, they drilled this stuff in my head. Right. Um, I, I have a, a better idea. It gives me better ideas to read that information. That's what I do. I, I'll go find the uh, shock surveys that the state guys have done. Look down that. And try to get, like we talked about, is it a bass heavy? Is it balanced? Is it, are there fewer bass? Kind of prepare yourself that way uh, to what, you know, mentally, what you, like I can promise you, if you're going to an impoundment that doesn't have many bass in it, you're going to need to bring your patience. Well, you're not going to get a lot of bites. Right. You mentioned something like that to me about commerce, but the ones you get are quality. The ones you get are quality, but you... Better not be mad about getting skunk five trips in a row. Well, because it's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, right. it's going to happen. Well, uh, one more question <clears throat> off the top of that. What about uh, someone who has listened to this today, and they say, okay, you know what? What he's saying makes sense about keeping fish. Mm -hmm. And all his life, he's been told, catch and release. Catch and release. He's yeah. a competitive bass angler. Mm -hmm. Catch and release. If you can't keep fish, you're destroying our fishery. Right. And, you know, the book says this. The fisherman says this. What do you say to that guy that wants to take a step out and say, you know what, let, let's reconsider what we're doing here. Now, on a big lakes like Lanier, that might not be possible, but on these smaller reservoirs like Yahula or a personal pond or something. Sure. You know, what, what kind of suggestions or advice would you give that guy that wants to, you know, let, let's, let's try keeping fish? Okay. Well, I think back 50 years ago when everybody kept everything they caught – that was not a good way to manage a fishery. Right. Throwing back everything you catch is not a good way to manage a fishery either. The truth lies somewhere in the middle. That makes sense. And first thing you have to do is understand the fish population and what it needs to be removed. Okay. You don't need to be removing bass from certain situations or trout from mountain streams. I absolutely, you know, practice catch and release there. Right. Um, but in the situation where the fish do need to be harvested and it would help the fishery to do it, you have to retrain your brain, you know? 
You just have to put that aside and go, all right, you know, I've got new information. And this information is these fish have to go from this impoundment. It's not every impoundment. I'm, I'm not saying keep every bass you ever catch everywhere you ever catch it. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that if you want bigger fish, you're going to have to keep them. Right. It's just, it is, it's, it's a whole that new is, way of thinking because that is not the way it's happening out there. No. Right now. And there are, I mean, I've definitely run into lakes where catch and release work great. You know, nobody ever, it just, it worked out that way, you know? Right. But, you know, based on 20 years of shocking experience, I wrote a lot of management plans that said harvest pass. That was the number one problem I came across. One of, one of the great things about doing this with you is I cannot wait to hear the comments. <laughs> Possibly to read the comments about people who people are, are going to be mad, man. They don't yeah. like that. It's it, they'd rather shoot their dog than keep a bass. Yeah, I'm telling you. But it was one of the things that I was looking forward to because I knew you were thinking outside the box compared to. But it's really not outside the box. It's probably the standard way of thinking it from a biology standpoint. Sure. And fishermen are thinking it from more of a competitive me standpoint. Right. So, um, I tell you what, I appreciate so much you coming down here, especially because I hadn't seen him forever. I appreciate the opportunity and. and We've already, for those listening, we've already in our minds and behind the scenes kind of planned some other stuff down the road with you and, and a couple more podcasts on different subjects. But I definitely want to hear the reaction to this. And maybe, you know, we might have to do a Facebook Live or something like that or take the camera out to you and just say, okay, you said this. Now here's the responses. And, and maybe give you a little rebuttal time. You know, I said this. They're going to, re- they're going to say this. And then give you a, a, another opportunity to say, well, they need sure. to consider this. I think that would be pretty interesting. Well, we've also got that uh, trophy trophy pond coming up that we're going to be right. working on. And uh, we'll be doing some harvesting out of there. And we'll actually be uh, looking at the fish in real time um, from what they started at to where they finished at. You know, um, That's going to be awesome. So we'll... I cannot wait to we'll see just all prove that it. stuff. So that'll work. But, man, I appreciate it so Thank much. Thank you so much, Danny. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Fish North Georgia podcast. If y'all have any topics or guests you'd like to see in the future, leave it in the comments below. Hit that subscribe button. Click that bell so that you'll be notified of any future videos. And don't forget to give us a follow on Facebook and Instagram at Fish North Georgia. And we look forward to seeing you soon.